Hi all, welcome back to Microbiology Lectures. Um, last time out we talked about the D value or the value we put on time to decrease a po population by 90%. Today we're going to talk about some techniques that we use um, in different industries and just uh, different uh, ways at which we control or um, can get to that D value, um, whether that be things like moist heat, or, um, high pressure, or chemical based treatments. These all, the ultimate goal is to reduce the population of microbe and, and get as really as fast as D value as possible. So let's dive into some of these techniques some are very old and still utilized constantly. Others are kind of new emerging techniques that may not be used um, that much due to high costs and, and whatnot. So moist heat, that is a definite old um, technique. Okay, Louis Pasteur uh, kind of developed this technique. Um, and uh, I mean, at least a portion of this technique with pasteurization. Yeah. We've boiled things for much longer than Louis, Louis Pasteur's pasteurization um, process, but moist heat, so mixing water and higher temperatures causes a protein denaturation process, which means that the, the proteins, the amino acid chains start to unravel and because you're mixing it with water, it, it, it occurs in an aqueous environment, um, water molecules can get in between the amino acid chains and bind up to the amino acids, and, and it causes a shape deformity in the proteins. Well, if you can imagine a microbe with the outside of their membrane just covered in these proteins, these transmembrane proteins that allow for things to come in and allow for them to pump things out on and you've mixed water and heat and those proteins are now changing shape well then the purpose of the protein is really it's gone and so it doesn't allow these um, organisms to live and that's the idea behind that boiling or um, mixing moist heat. Um, again, we can kill a lot of pathogens with it, especially the heat-sensitive path pathogens. Um, endospores, unfortunately, can survive. Remember, the endospore formation is often triggered by environmental change um, of the extreme kind. So. Uh, you increase the temperature and you will entice certain bacteria species to form endospores. And so, and that's their way of surviving these environments that are not suitable. Uh, so, un unfortunately for this method, a lot of endospores can survive. But pasteurization, um, okay, again, old method, been around since the late 1800s and um, still today used all the time. It's much more refined today than it was when Louis Pasteur uh, first kind of invented it, but the process is very similar. Increase the temperature of typically a liquid, um, and you increase it for a certain amount of time. Okay? In this case, milk in the United States is about 72 degrees Celsius. For 15 seconds, um, that is the amount of time that we need to destroy the microorganisms and the viruses that would be in that milk and increase the um, shelf life of that product. Now, remember, um, we're talking often we're talking about a D value, knocking the population by 90 percent. It doesn't mean that these products are sterile. And they still will have pathogens or potential pathogens in them. That's why milk and ice cream and, and other products have shelf lives. It's because over a period of time that those 
organisms that would spoil that product do come back. They do increase, but the initial process allows for us to um, have a product last a little bit longer. Okay? And then, of course, there's other ways at which we can go about um, this process. We can do what's called ultra pasteurization, where now instead of you know pasteurizing for um, a few seconds um, at cooler temperatures, now you're increasing the temperature quite a bit, which can denature the proteins in the material that you're interested in. But normally it makes it stable, um, shelf stable. So they don't have to be refrigerated any longer. So, um, you know, box juices or sometimes you'll see like boxed milk that, um, you know, chocolate milk and things like that um, that can go on the shelf and they don't have to be refrigerated. That's ultra pasteurization. It means a much higher temperature. Again, probably for a few seconds, depends on the product depends on how much you're doing um, but that allows for um, it to get closer to um, uh, to sterilization okay um, still not getting sterilization there's still a shelf life on it but it's to the point where most of the organisms that could cause any pathogenic effect they're very low if present at all and this is just kind of a diagram of, of the way in which we pasteurize milk products. Um, you know, very different than Louis Pasteur did on his bench top. But again, um, you know, you, you will have raw milk products come in, um, and then heated, and then you know they're heated to a specific temperature. Again, I, like I have specific temperatures here. These are for the United States, 72 degrees Celsius for milk and 82 for ice cream. Um, other countries pasteurize at other temperatures, not um, necessarily the same as us. Um, so they'd have different machines, different controls, they have different shelf lives of their products. Um, but, you know, the United States kind of, you know, these are what we use. Um, so again, it's a similar process. You heat it, you cool it, um, if it's like things like ice cream, you're super cooling it. If it's ultra pasteurization, you super cool it even more. Um, and then it can go right into a bottling process. Um, and that's, you know, that, that's what increases the shelf life of products like milk. Okay. We'll talk about a different type of pasteurization later. Another way at which we can use heat and water or moisture is by um, autoclaving or using an autoclave system right, which is using steam and um, pressure and heat to destroy uh, the vegetative state um, or the denature the proteins of different pathogens. In this process unlike pasteurization, the goal really is to sterilize. Um, and so the temperatures are to a point where um, sterilization happens. It can kill the endospores or destroy the endospores. Um, and depending on the material that is being autoclaved, whether it's a liquid or solids, um, so we autoclave lots of medical tools, we autoclave um, lots of liquids that need to be sterile, um, especially in micro labs, you know, we're autoclaving augers and things like that, water, um, just to make sure that there's no microbes in there um, when we initially start the studies. You know, um, that kind of sweet spot for most things is about 121 degrees Celsius. Um, that's the point at where most vegetative viral um, entities will denature most the majority of proteins um, at least that have been discovered and tested will denature uh, you know temperatures up to about 121 um, and then obviously the amount of time that these things have to spend in an autoclave is 
determine on what's the volume, what's the surface area, how much do you have inside the autoclave, etc. Um, there are fat flash sterilization processes where you're not talking about minutes or um, even hours of sterilization, but you're talking about you know a matter of seconds or a couple minutes, much shorter period of time. It really depends on what is being sterilized. But the goal, um, again, is sterilization, not getting a 90% reduction, not getting a devalue, you know, but getting complete sterilization. And remember when we talked about this a little bit before, complete sterilization means that you have one in a millionth chance of swapping that piece of equipment or that liquid or whatever and getting a microbe. Okay, that's what we consider sterile. So it means that there's no life. Um, recent studies, kind of recent avenues with um, studying things like chronic wasting disease and other diseases that might be pyron derivatives, um, have noticed that just autoclaving that material, uh, if it's a pyron related material, is not enough. Um, so we need to use sodium hydroxide or some other extreme base or extreme acid to um, start the process of breaking down proteins um, if it's like pri uh, pyron protein layers um, if it's something else you know that might not autoclave very well maybe it's lipid base maybe it's a biofilm base or something like that you, you might need it to break down some of those uh, material before you do the autoclaving process. Okay? And so again, a lot of this is you know live and learn. Um, and you know the the more equipment, the better our equipment gets, the better ability we have to actually getting to sterilization. Um, and you know we talked at the very beginning of this how. Uh, just washing your hands was a huge process and a huge advantage in the late 1850s. Well, in you know the 2000s, machines like autoclaves and whatnot have, have really allowed us to make sure that our instruments or our liquids or whatever are as sterile as possible um, prior to use. Okay, well, another entity, another industry that um, really likes to get to that as close to sterilization process as possible is the food in industry because it's really important from a perspective of if you're going to go and take a can of food off a shelf, um, that that can of food is not, does not have botulism does not have the presence of endospores um, that could cause botulism inside of it growing while it's sitting on the shelf um, that that can is as sterile as possible um, from pathogenic uh, bacteria or viruses that could be in um, in those situations um, it can take a long time for uh, these processes to occur, and so um, often, you know, looking for extreme reduction of endospores to the point where, you know, not having endo in any endospores is, is the ultimate goal. Sometimes uh, other things are added to the canned food if they're if it's really hard or you can't have a very long process because it changes the texture or it changes the flavor of whatever is being canned. Sometimes other things are added to the canning process like, uh, you know, acidics, so acids, or sometimes um, there's additives that are added like salt and other things that just make it um, a uninhabitable environment for pathogens to grow in. But that being said, you know, the commercial food industry is also realizing that there will be the presence of some um, 
microbes that occur in the product that they're providing. The ultimate goal though is to make sure that the microbes that are in that product are not microbes that um, can grow while, while the product is sitting on a shelf at, so at room temperature. So they, you know, they're trying to maintain something that, you know, if, if you have very, if you have microbes that need extreme temperatures to grow, okay, well, they can stay, um, especially given the process of autoclaving or using a retort, um, would increase temperatures. And so those, those organisms might be able to stay because outside of the autoclaving process, probably not getting temperatures to that point. So uh, this is kind of what they look like. I mean, in the previous slide you saw an autoclaver. Um, this is basically just a giant autoclave. Okay? Um, canned foods will go in and, and the autoclave process can take a long time. But um, that's what allows, this process is really what allows the shelf life of say like a can of green beans um, for you to you know, go years without having the chance of forming um, like a botulism or a bacteria inside that can. Dry heat, okay, most in microbiology labs, you, know, you guys are very familiar with a dry heat, so using um, incinerators or using Bunsen burners or, um, uh, you know, other ways at which you can sterilize or you can flame um, certain tools for the process of removing uh, bacteria. Other ways in which we use this is to de destroy medical waste, carcasses, potentially um, uh, not just animal carcasses, but human carcasses if, if there's an outbreak and, and the material is said to be um, not, like the humans are not, you're not able to bury the human um, given the potential for that transfer process of happen happening, um, the organisms are incinerated. Um, so there are like mobile incinerators. This is a it's kind of a big process when we deal with things like a mad cow disease outbreak or um, you know some uh, avian flu outbreak that breaks out in like chicken stocks or you know cattle yards or. Um, uh, like swine facilities and things like that where you have to have a massive cull off and you, mu and you must kill a huge population um, instead of just piling all those bodies up and burning them um, on, on the uh, you know, grounds a lot of times an incinerator will be brought in and the, you know, the carcasses will be shoved into the incinerator and turned to ash um, this you know, this process, you know, a thousand degrees Celsius is cooking everything. There's nothing living through that, um, that we know of on the planet currently. Um, other ways that we can go about destroying some cell components, um, and denaturing proteins is like benchtop, um, hot ovens. So you might see these in some laboratories, these hot baking ovens. They're a little, um, I don't know. I guess they, I'd say they're less common today um, because of the incineration process and that you can just bag it and, and incinerate it. But one of the methods that used to be present is um, you could incinerate or cook the microbes inside of, you know, benchtop hot air ovens um, as long as the temperature got above 175 degrees Celsius. Uh, you're probably pretty good. And so, uh, again, these are just tools of the trade, um, ways at which we can get to sterilization. Um, some of these sterilizing <laughs> methods that you can imagine, if you're destroying medical waste or if you're cooking things to 1,000 degrees or 175 degrees Celsius, um, they're probably not usable anymore, that material that you're cooking to that um, temperature. 
filtration is really really common in a few industries uh, the um, water industry or drinking water and wastewater management industries uh, I mean filtration is like it's it's the end-all be-all kind of thing uh, um, and the first process to processing water is to filter it and there's lots of ways at which material is filtered um, majority of the time we're shooting for the smallest filter to be right around 0.2 micrometers or 0.2 microns um, because that's going to remove all all the known bacteria um, are bigger than 0.2 micrometers uh, viruses however are you know there are many viruses and virons and pyrons that are much smaller than 0.2 micrometers but normally our membranes or membrane filters are, are for that purpose is to rem the removal of bacteria um, so again uh, wastewater treatment plants or drinking water treatment plants will often have um, vertical or horizontal filters that work um, in different patterns water is ran through these systems okay and you know a system of filters are inside um, typically inside these tubes and so it might look like something like this where your first filter is going to filter out sediment um, and then you might have a sand filter after that which would get things that are smaller that made it through the sediment filter and these often the sand filter and sediment filter that's going to filter out the majority of your eukaryotic um, species so your you know protozoans like giardia and uh, cryptosporidium potentially um, it could filter out your algaes these kind of things now your prokaryotic organisms um, that might be pathogenic you have to use one of these micro filters um, so normally we call that micro filtration and so they they're those filters um, you know a little more involved process typically you'll have a few stacked and um, removing the material from the that and so um, depending on the system I mean we can go all the way to the point of reverse osmosis where you're removing things at you know a thousand microns um, or uh, like extremely small a thousandth micron sorry um, you know extremely small uh, material and that should at least based on what we know about viruses that should handle um, removal of the viruses and we'll talk more about sizes and things like that um, later okay another way that filtration can occur is filtration of air many of you are very familiar after the, the most recent COVID outbreak um, with N95s or sometimes called KN95s depends on the manufacturer but same same thing um, provide protection up to to or down to 0.3 micrometers um, and larger so that should remove majority of the bacteria associated with it um, HEPA filters same kind of thing about 0.3 um, and so the, the filters that you typically see in facilities like hospitals and biological laboratories and things like that that might be considered HEPA or highly efficient particulate air filters um, you know they're they're removing just like the water filter they kind of work on the same premise you have this pre filter which which removes a lot of the larger stuff the stuff that makes through that would go to another filter and that removes the smaller stuff and then the stuff that makes it through that might go to another filter um, which hopefully rem removes all the remaining chances um, of pathogens making it through the filter, especially in uh, like a hospital situation or a laboratory situation. Um, I, I, so most of the time when we're talking about bacteria, we're talking about one to 10 micrometers in size. 
Um, so HEPA filters, N95s, they work really well for bacteria. Viruses, on the other hand, it depends on the type of virus. Um, you know, for some larger viruses, these filters work well. Um, but for some of these smaller viruses, uh, they can flow through these the filters. So you need another way um, to control for that those viruses. Okay. Next time we come back, we'll talk about um, kind of novel um, methods or methods that are not as familiar to many people.